Hello and welcome to Chicago Reacts, Americans Learn. My name is Colin, and today I'm watching World War I, 1917 from Epic History TV. And this is part five in a six-part series on World War I. Uh, so if you haven't watched the other parts, go back and watch that, and Come back and enjoy this video, I suppose. Um, but yeah, so we're getting towards the end. Uh, only one more video in this series, and I guess... We're in the second to last year of the war itself. Uh, and I did get a, uh, a content warning when I first clicked on the link for this one. So it's probably going to be a, a heavy episode, I think. Um, that's what I gathered from that. Um, so yeah, with that being said, be sure to give us a like, share, and subscribe. And uh, why don't I bring this up to full screen? And there we go. Let's get into it. In 1916, World War I became a war of attrition. Both sides began to focus less on winning victory on the battlefield than grinding down the enemy and inflicting such enormous losses they would be forced to surrender. In 1917, the strategy will push Europe's major powers to the brink of collapse. Germany knows it will lose a long war of attrition against the Allies, who have greater resources. So its leaders gamble. They resume unrestricted submarine warfare, believing their U-boats can cut off Britain's food imports by sea and starve the country into surrender within six months. But the new shoot-on-sight tactics mean neutral American ships will inevitably be caught in the crossfire, risking America joining the war on the Allied side. Just two days into the campaign, the SS Housatonic, an American steamer carrying wheat from Galveston, Texas to England, is sunk by a U-boat. The British then pass to the US government a telegram they've intercepted from German Foreign Secretary Arthur Zimmermann to the German ambassador in Mexico. Germany is encouraging Mexico to attack America if America and Germany end up at war. Hmm. The so-called Zimmermann telegram puts yet more pressure on US President Wilson to declare war on Germany. I don't think I knew that bit about uh, Mexico. Um, yeah, I don't, or at least I don't remember that from uh, when I was learning about this in high school or junior high. I don't remember exactly when I this was covered in my schooling, but uh, yeah, I don't remember Mexico being involved in like being a, a threat, like on Germany's side too. Like, wow. Um, so there you go. One more thing learned new today. Let's keep going. In Russia, enormous casualties and bread shortages lead to riots and revolution. The Tsar abdicates. A provisional government takes charge, pledging to continue the war. But at the front, Russian troops begin to desert en masse. After a string of German provocations, the US finally declares war on Germany. It brings immense resources to the Allied cause, but they will take many months to mobilize. And the German gamble of unrestricted submarine warfare may still pay off. April is the U-boat's most successful month of the war. They sink 886,000 tons of Allied shipping, Whoa. an average of 17 ships a day, all packed with urgently needed food and supplies. Oh man. Wow, 17 a day, that is, that's a lot. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'd be panicking uh, <laughs> if I were on the other end of that. Jeez. Uh, and how many? 600,000 tons per month? Gee, wow. Or that was their target, I guess. But they, 
Yeah, exceeded that in April. Good golly. Okay. Britain will face starvation if the U-boats are not defeated soon. On the Western Front, the British launched the Battle of Arras, a diversion to support a major upcoming French offensive. After heavy fighting, Canadian troops seized the high ground of Vimy Ridge. It's a limited Allied victory, but costs 150,000 Allied casualties to 130,000 German. Above the trenches, the first air war has reached new levels of sophistication and deadliness. Reconnaissance aircraft are crucial for spotting enemy positions and directing artillery fire onto them. Scout aircraft or fighters try to shoot them down before they can execute their mission. New models of aircraft are developed every few months, but that spring the superiority of German aircraft leads to heavy Allied losses in what becomes known as Bloody April. I often wonder, like, you know, the, for those of you who have seen uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade where they're in the biplane, was it a bi I think it was a biplane, uh, trying to escape the Nazis and uh, uh, Jones Sr., um, shoots out the the tail um of the plane how often things like that occurred during world war one during dog fights like that at least because like in that in that video there it looked like there were at least some like uh uh i don't know some supporting cables uh in the way there where he was shooting at least that's i don't know if, from the perspective that's what it looked like to me uh yeah i wonder how often that like actually occurred people accidentally shooting their own plane uh during that time, or if there were preventative measures and that whole scene in Indiana Jones was just, you know, a, a theatrical, uh, <laughs> uh, what do you call it? Uh, storytelling plot device. Um, you know, let me know in the comments if you know the answer to that. Uh, all right, let's keep going. Three days after the fall of Vimy Ridge, French General Robert Nivelle launches his main offensive. Expectations are high, but after initial success, the advance bogs down and casualties quickly mount on both sides. The apparently senseless losses cause morale in the French army to collapse. Whole units mutiny, refusing to attack. General Nivelle is sacked as French commander-in-chief and replaced by General Pétain, hero of Verdun, who promises no more suicidal attacks. That summer, at Messines Ridge, the British tunnel under the German lines and detonate 19 enormous mines under the enemy position. It's the largest man-made explosion in history to date and paves the Damn. way to a brilliant but highly low British victory. That is quite a large crater. I'm assuming that's from the one that they're talking about, but to to, to think that the largest man-made explosion was not a nuclear weapon of some kind? Like, th they said the largest man-made explosion to date, right? Is that what he said? Explosion in history to date. Yeah. It's under the enemy position. It's the largest man-made explosion in history to date. Like, that's, that's crazy to think about, like, how much... I'm trying to imagine just how much explosives, like, were in, involved in that. Did they say? I don't want to go back again, but... Uh... Dang. I, I wouldn't have guessed that. Honestly, that's terrifying. And, and impressive. Like, terrifyingly impressive, I guess. Uh, yeah. And paves the way to a brilliant, but highly local, British victory. In 
Greece, King Constantine, who has favoured neutrality, is forced to abdicate, and Greece joins the Allies. Russia's provisional government orders a new attack, but the July offensive is a disaster. The morale and discipline of the Russian army has collapsed. It can no longer be relied on to fight, and the Central Powers' counterattack is almost unopposed. At sea, the Allies begin to group their merchant ships into convoys, which sail under naval escort. The new system leads to a steady fall in losses. The tide is turning in the U-boat war. As discontent with the war grows in Germany, the German parliament, the Reichstag, passes a peace resolution, calling for a peace of understanding and reconciliation. It's ignored by the German high command, which now effectively rules the country as a military dictatorship. In Belgium, the British launch their major offensive of 1917, the Third Battle of Ypres. It will be remembered as Passchendaele. Heavy shelling, rain and broken irrigation channels turn the battlefield into a sea of mud. In these impossible conditions, all hopes of a breakthrough soon fade. The attack is called off after three months, by which point the British have suffered 240,000 casualties. The Germans, 200,000. On the Italian front, at the 11th Battle of the Isonzo, Italian and Austro-Hungarian forces batter each other into exhaustion. There are 150,000 Italian casualties, 100,000 Austro-Hungarian. That year, 1917, the list of Allied nations grows. Brazil, Liberia, China and Siam all declare war on Germany as a result of German U-boat attacks or to curry favour with the Allies. China will contribute many thousands of labourers working for the Allies in Europe, the Middle East and Asia. That year in the Middle East, British forces avenge their 1916 humiliation at Kut by defeating the Ottoman Turks and marching on to occupy Baghdad. British forces in Egypt advance across the Sinai Desert, but are thrown back by Ottoman forces at the first and second battles of Gaza. In July, Arab rebels capture the strategic Ottoman port of Aqaba. They are accompanied by a British military advisor, Captain T. E. Lawrence, better known as Lawrence of Arabia. There you go. That all I knew. I knew from you know. It's been a while since I've seen the movie, but I did know that uh, he was uh, a real life person. But uh, kind of forgot about that until just now. <laughs> So yeah, oh, uh, interesting reminder of that. Yeah, kind of, or I guess a, a reminder for me to go back and rewatch the movie. It's, it's time, I guess. Autumn, British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour issues the Balfour Declaration, expressing support for the creation of a national home for the Jews in Palestine. The aim is to rally Jewish support for the Allies but the declaration contradicts existing pledges to Arab leaders. In October, the British finally win at Gaza, clearing the way for an advance into Palestine. Six weeks later, General Allenby leads British troops into Jerusalem, ending 400 years of Ottoman rule.
With Russian forces in disarray, Germany is able to move troops from the east to the Italian front. At the Battle of Caporetto, they help to smash through the Italian army, advancing 70 miles and taking a quarter of a million prisoners. British and French divisions, desperately needed on the Western Front, have to be redeployed to shore up the line. In Russia, a second revolution brings Lenin's Bolshevik party to power. He is determined to end Russia's involvement in the war. In France, Georges Clemenceau becomes Prime Minister. Nicknamed the Tiger, he promises total war and total victory. But for the Allies in late 1917, final victory looks uncertain. Russia has stopped fighting. French armies are recovering from mutiny. The God, I'm just like looking at those two guys with the uh, the bandages around their faces. You know, the the, the exposure is, is really dark on their faces. You can't really make out much features, but just seeing those those bandages just make me wonder what what's going on underneath. I also, maybe don't want to know. Jeez, uh, because I know if I remember correctly, I think it's during this time. Was it during this war or maybe the Civil War where like plastic surgery started becoming uh, a thing to reconstruct soldiers who were like uh, wounded and disfigured uh, from the war? Uh, yeah. Hmm. Let's keep going. The Italian front has almost collapsed and American reinforcements still seem a long way off. For the time being, the British are the only effective Allied force in the field. So the British attack at Cambrai with the first major tank assault in history. On the first day, nearly 400 tanks spearhead an advance of several miles through German defences. But then the tanks break down or are knocked out. The Germans rush in reinforcements and the gains are lost. Finland declares independence from Russia. Romania, isolated by the Russian collapse, signs an armistice with the Central Powers. Six days later, Russia also signs an armistice. The Allied Eastern Front is no more. 1917 has seen one major Allied power, Russia, knocked out of the war. But the arrival of a fresh new ally, America. Germany knows only military victory can now save it from being overwhelmed by Allied resources and begins planning one last massive onslaught for the spring of 1918. Epic History TV relies on the support of fellow history lovers. So if you like what we do, please consider pledging anything from $1 per video at the channel's Patreon page. We're seeing there in that, uh and credit thing there. They, it looks like they have a series on Blackbeard. I might be interested in looking at that for a later series. Um, but yeah. Um, a lot happened in 1917, didn't it? Um, yeah, I, I guess, like, it, it's funny because obviously they're called, you know, World War One, World War Two for a reason, but, like, I may have mentioned this in one of the earlier videos too, but it's just funny to like my memory of learning about it. Like I, I tend to only think about, you know, the European countries that were involved, but there's a reason why it's called world, a world war. <laughs> um, and yeah, uh, being reminded uh, of all the other uh, countries around the globe and uh, in different continents that were also involved. Um, like it's, should be a duh kind of uh, thing to think about, but 
also good to be remembered or reminded remembered um be reminded about uh all the other places that were involved and had casualties and massive losses and were impacted by the insanity of <laughs> what was world war one um but yeah thanks for watching everyone i hope you enjoyed and uh again be sure to like share and subscribe if you want to continue following along and maybe uh get notified when i do the uh, blackbeard series if you're interested in that uh yeah if that is a thing I, I i wasn't sure if that was something from their channel or one of their uh their sponsors i wasn't totally paying attention i was so distracted just by seeing blackbeard but um yeah until next time i'll see you later have a good one thanks for watching